Now, the second day of the Africa CEO Forum dealt with how African states can compete in a global tech arms race. Companies are developing algorithms that can speedily basic analyze legal contracts. Now, some can even write news stories as well. There's always tension, however, between what firms and individuals want to experiment with and what governments will permit. Well, CGTN's Raman Yang explored how to resolve that tension and persistent fears about job losses. Both the threat and the opportunity presented by rapid advances in technology was a key underlying theme in just about every single topic that was covered today at the Africa CEO Forum. And that covers everything from private equity on one hand to solar energy investments on the other. Those attending this forum, though, are firmly in the opportunity camp. This was the argument made a little earlier by the CEO and founder of the ISON Group. Uh, human mind is very adaptable. Uh, if you increase the productivity, some of this mundane work would be done by machines. But that frees up human capital. You know, a human is working too hard today. And I think if all of us work 20% less because of the productivity, 20% new jobs are created. So I'm not too worried about uh, technology uh, replacing human and all that. I just think that that would increase productivity and the benefit of productivity would come back to the society. Now, for technology systems to thrive, however, governments need to strike this thin balance between public safety and security on the other hand, but without restricting innovation unnecessarily on the other. And some countries are struggling to find where that balance lies. Take Kenya, for example. It's well behind her peers in East Africa in approving the commercial use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, if you prefer. When regulations on that sector finally did come up for commercial use in December, they were roundly criticized. Just getting access to a drone and actually being able to operate one will cost amateur users, even not, not even commercial ones, amateur users north of 500 US dollars. And that doesn't even cover the issues on cryptocurrencies as well. That said, there are some here who are optimistic about where that balance will be found. It all depends on, you know, where, where you look at it from. I mean, look, there is, uh, you, you, you know, you, even within our government, you've seen some are very pro-blockchain, crypto, uh, you know, technology. Um, some are saying, no, it's not something that we want to look at. And you understand it as well, because, you know, if it's not regulated, what are we moving? What value are you moving? What, where, where are those funds generated from? Where is that money generated from? So I think it all depends on, you know, where you look at it from. I think what I have seen personally is the government is a lot more open to listen. They're a lot more open to understand, okay, what is it that you're trying to do? How can we make sure it is, you know, what you're saying is what you're doing? Um, so I think we have to also take that into consideration a little bit. I mean, obviously, look, cryptocurrency is new for the whole world. Whether we talk about Kenya or anywhere else in the world, governments are still trying to understand what is it, you know? Um, are these utility tokens? Are they, and, and, and what are their purposes? And all of them have different, you know, when you, when you look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, etc. They all have very, very different, you know, functionality. So I think we need to give them time, and I think we should also play a part in educating them, um, so that they can actually understand. Because the minute people see things they can't understand, and they can't see the transparency through it, you know, there's a challenge, right? Darshan Chandaria there from the Chandaria Group speaking to me a little earlier. So then, in summary, those attending this forum do agree that as far as the global tech arms race is concerned, African countries, African economies cannot afford to be left behind. The question, however, is where that balance lies between public safety and security on hand and not restricting the market to the extent that innovation and creativity in that tech space completely dies out. Who will make those investments? Who will set those ground rules? Those are questions that are still looking for answers. At the Africa CEO Forum in Abidjan, I'm Raman Yang. Well, let's find out more about day two of the forum. CGTN's Raman Yang now joins us in Abidjan. Rama, great to see you. Now, today we saw Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire announce the Abidjan Declaration on their respective cocoa sectors. Tell us a little bit more about that. Indeed, Uche. It's one of those interesting instances where governments actually stop talking about what they're going to do and they actually get around to doing something. Now, keep in mind, these two countries, between them, supply about 60% of the world's entire cocoa supply. That's a lot of market-moving power, whichever you look at it. What the Abidjan Declaration essentially means is that they will closely coordinate and essentially harmonize um, pricing, 
across both sides of the border, which at least on paper should eliminate the price differential that we have seen between what farmers in Ghana are paid for their cocoa and what farmers in Cote d'Ivoire are paid for pretty much the exact same product. There's often a differential of about 30 or so percent between those two. So that arbitrage opportunity, at least with this agreement, will disappear completely. They also, however, are calling for a lot more private investment in the processing of cocoa output from their countries domestically. And that's a pretty big uh, game changer if, and that's a big one, if it does actually happen. There were no details within the context of the declaration, however, on what offers will be made, what incentives these governments will offer in order to actually entice processing to move from, say, Western Europe, for example, and bring it back here to where essentially the best cocoa in the world really is produced. It's a very interesting agreement. We'll keep a close eye on how this plays out. Richard. Now, Rama, as the meeting comes to a close, we know it was all about enabling Africa's private sector to formulate action plans and certainly uh, as they strive to become more competitive globally. Now, what were some of the resolutions that came out of this summit? Indeed, a closer collaboration with government, uh, as we just heard from that conversation, uh, extracts rather, of that conversation there with uh, Darshan Shindaria. That certainly was a key theme in a lot of the conversations that we had uh, in the last 48 hours. It's not just enough to see government as an adversary, but at the same time, you can't simply operate in an environment uh, where you're so close to government that you essentially become part and parcel of them. That was one of the arguments that cropped up in a discussion around private equity a little earlier as well. It is absolutely vital for companies to keep on investing, to keep on pushing the boundaries on what can be done because African countries and these economies, the 54 plus on this continent, have an enormous opportunity to leapfrog old tech and establish legacy technology in other more advanced markets. But ultimately, the question of integrated markets kept on coming up over and over and over again. The CFT, of course, as you covered in Kigali last week, which was signed um, by 44 countries. It still needs to be ratified in the next 180 or so days. But at the end of the day, because all of these individual countries you're talking about are relatively small by themselves, there is power in numbers. And companies are busy urging the government to say, look, it's not just enough to say we're going to sign uh, trade deals and actually make it easier to move money and people and goods across borders. You've actually got to go to the extra step and make sure that those deals become a reality on the ground. So there's a lot of work to be done on both sides. But the basic call from the private sector here is let's stop talking too much. Let's actually see some action getting done. A good message there. Well, many thanks, Rama, uh, for those insights. Of course, that was Rama Nyang, and he was joining us there in Abidjan.